proud of yourself for doing that too. Because that's the hardest part. Memorizing it isn't the hardest part. Getting on the stage and speaking in front of people is the hardest part. So really good job with that, okay? Greenwood has so many traditions, old and new, but perhaps the most long-standing tradition of the school is the Gettysburg Address. It is a phenomenal moment. It is a time in which all of our great energy goes to those boys. And we realize the incredible perseverance and the incredible strength and the incredible bravery that they bring every day, whether it's Gettysburg or whether it's in the classroom. We know that it's hard. We know that it takes immense strength. There are even times when students need to take a pause from reciting and memorizing. And at that point, what happens is their teacher or their advisor or someone close to them finds the right words at the right time to put them back together, guide them back to the stage, and start anew. Greenwood is powerful. It is transformative and we love what we do. What an amazing accomplishment at the end of their time here for a Greenwood boy to be able to say, I never thought that I would be able to read, or I never thought that I would be able to write, or I never thought that I would go to college. Gettysburg is a stepping stone towards those end results. It's a way for students to realize that they can be bigger than themselves, doing something for others, reaching out for the greater good. When they succeed, and our boys will always succeed in one fashion or another, they will walk away with a sense of pride that you can see on their face, in their body, in their whole being. Gettysburg is not just a speech. It is not just a recitation. It is a moment, it is an experience, it is a metaphor for the journey that these boys are on. When they're working on Gettysburg, when they are here at Greenwood, when they're in their classes, every focus that we have is how to help them bring back that sense of confidence and bring back that sense of passion, and that makes it all worthwhile. I have a tendency to get easily distracted. I've taken opportunities for exciting new, incredible experiences here from demolition derby to going to a winter festival in Key, New Hampshire. I've been playing soccer outside at Greenwood and inside. I've been playing hockey on the frozen pond or going to this new ski resort. I think part of the reason I'm more confident sometimes now is because I've been doing these new, trying new things, having new experiences. I thank Greenwood for that. I really do. I really thank them for that. Greenwood really has changed my life for the better. Greenwood has like allowed me to be more independent and also be like a more social person because like back in my old schools, I was like really shy. I didn't really have that much friends, and I was kind of like a little bit socially awkward. It was a little bit sad, obviously, because all I wanted was acceptance. You just want to have friends, but those friends just don't want to be with you. But now at Greenwood, like, I feel like I've made a lot of progress, and it's even like easier to meet friends, because even like a lot of the people here are kind of like socially similar to me. Greenwood has allowed me to be less shy in social situations. It definitely feels really good. It's definitely changed my life. I feel more grown up and I feel more disciplined and academically capable. I'm really thankful. If they haven't been liking their school, they could probably um, ask 
their mom for a new school. Like how I did it. Lucky that my mom found this place for me because I've never had a school that's so much fun. My old school, when I first came, it didn't start well. But since this school, it's gone more above than above. I'd rather be here than any other school. They make me feel like I belong here. I can't believe I've gotten this far. I've never gotten this far in my life before. When Aunt Beppo said I qualified, I couldn't believe it. I'm actually going to finish this and go into the Latches Theater for our Gettysburg. I've never been this happy before. I've never. Before we begin this afternoon, I just will remind you about phones and that there are uh, restrooms behind the theater um, for you to travel to or go to if you need. And I just ask you, if you choose to stand up and use the restroom at any point, please do it in between speeches or when there is a break. Good afternoon and welcome to the historic Latches Theater in Brattleboro, Vermont. You may recall that a year ago, this th same theater was also our setting for Gettysburg. And while the boys performed their speeches flawlessly from start to finish, they did so to a relatively empty theater as we respected the guidelines surrounding the COVID-19 virus. Today, however, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Greenwood trustees, parents, family members, friends, past and current faculty and staff to the 43rd Gettysburg Address hosted by the Greenwood School. It is note noteworthy uh, as a reminder or just to let you know that it, it was this very theater where Ken Burns, a well-known filmmaker who produced the original The Address, documenting the Gettysburg Address at Greenwood, that the premiere of that film happened here at the Latches Theater. So we returned here for this event. Ralph Waldo Emerson, born in 1803, was an essayist, lecturer, and perhaps best known as a poet who penned the simple yet profound verse. Life is about the journey, not the destination. I am reasonably sure that Mr. Emerson would have happily joined us today for our Gettysburg event. Not only would he have enjoyed the lovely setting, of this historic theater, but he would find the boy's speeches to be extraordinary, their delivery exquisite, their choice of material unique, and their commitment to embarking on the journey outstanding. The Gettysburg Address event has been a mainstay of the Greenwood School since 1978 and represents the very best of who we are as a school. Mr. Emerson's words that life is about the journey aptly defines a Greenwood student's experience every day of every year. Preparing for the Gettysburg event is just one of the many roads we travel as students, faculty, and staff to create what we talk about as this Greenwood experience. 
As a community, we begin our school year with a blank canvas. And over the year, we fill our canvas with powerful, life-changing moments. Our creative art students and studios are open from sunup to sundown as students try their hand at painting and drawing, pottery, and three-dimensional masterpieces. Our classrooms become the hub of learning, sharing, and contemplation as faculty members lead thought-provoking discuss discussions and invite students to push their academic boundaries. Our community afternoon and evening programs offer a wide array of opportunities from the physical to the creative. And our experiential programs invite students into the woodlands where they learn to tap sugar maples for syrup production, travel to Ecuador on a two-week immersion trip, or summit of Vermont Peak in the middle of a winter storm. Each experience, each road taken, broadens our students' horizons and begins to prepare them for life away from this small but mighty school in southern Vermont. With the support of faculty and staff, each each Greenwood boy designs their individualized roadmap and dedicates himself towards achieving his goals and executing his action plan. These personalized and well-worn maps provide direction, anticipate challenge, remind them to rest when rest is needed, and applaud them for their achievement. The Greenwood map provides the structure the Greenwood boy delivers the outcome. Perhaps one of the most poignant markers of a Gettysburg Roadmap is watching a student who has already qualified take the time and effort to cheer on their classmate. On one such occasion, as I was passing through the great room, I listened as a returning student who had just qualified turned to a new student who was slowly, slowly taking the stage and say, you've got this. I was where you were last year, and I know you can do it. These words of encouragement come in all shapes and sizes and are shared without coaxing or polish. Students whose daily lives at Greenwood may not overlap suddenly are sitting next to each other in the great room, waiting for their practice, waiting for their time to step onto the stage and share constructive points about pace and articulation and volume and eye contact. Gettysburg levels the playing field. To our students, we often use transformational to describe what happens at Greenwood. This experience, the Greenwood experience and the Gettysburg experience is no doubt transformational for you, for your parents, and for all of us gathered together today. Greenwood has embraced and supported the individual journey and today's Gettysburg, Gettysburg event is representative of your growing self-advocacy and self-confidence. Let's be crystal clear on a few absolutes. You are brilliant, creative, hardworking, and so incredibly talented. Despite any apprehension that you might have about performing today, the simple fact is you are here, dressed to the nines, and sharing your strength of character. Similar to the academic classes you are enrolled in and the activities you choose to participate in, you are an individual, unique and talented. What a gift you are giving to all of us today as we listen and honor your hard work. So let's give these students an early round of applause. To the Greenwood faculty, over the last seven months, you have welcomed, guided, and spent countless hours with our students. 
You are their teachers, advisors, dorm parents, afternoon and weekend coaches and role models. At times, you have bypassed your own family or family commitments to engage and care for an advisee. You have stood down by Watt Pond on a late fall day because Wyatt or Jack or Parker wanted to take that last dip into the, into the water. You have come in early during the week to teach a 7.30 a.m. class and stayed up late on a Saturday night playing magic with the boys in the common room. You are among the most talented and dedicated professionals I have ever had the good fortune to stand beside. Your ability to create brilliance, encourage learning, and instill confidence resonates daily and in every arena. Thank you for who you are and for your belief in Greenwood. To the faculty. And to our parents, your role as partners with Greenwood cannot be highlighted enough. And we know that when you decided that Greenwood was the right school for your son, you saw us as a community where your child would be understood, viewed as an individual, and they would be happy. Today is a testament not only to your son's achievement, but to you for knowing and believing that your child is worthy of all good things. I hope your heart is beaming and you have some Kleenex nearby because I bet you're going to need them. Thank you to our parents. It looks like we're just about ready to begin, so I will invite Azor to bring his row up to stage and to travel to the stage right. Is that right? I hope that's right. Uh, to get ready for your recitations. So, Azor. For our first speaker, I'd like to call Azor Hartenstein to the stage. On deck is Jack Shaw. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. For the brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, nor long remember, what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It's for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. We here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain and that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom 
and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Thanks, Azor. I'd like to call to the stage Jack Shaw on deck, C.J. Bonner. Seen in the hands of countless cowboys and Indians, and countless Westerns, the Henry Winchester rifle is often hailed as one of the guns that won the West. There's a lot more to the story than that. The rifle that became known as a Winchester had a long and torturous development, involving some of the era's most influential businessmen and inventors. Its famed lever action fought the Civil War along with many other great battles, long before it became the favorite in the likes of Buffalo Bill, Sharpshooter Annie Oakley, and even President Teddy Roosevelt. In 1857, Winchester renamed his firm the New Haven Arms Company and hired Benjamin Tyler Henry as new factory foreman. Uh, Henry replaced, abandoned the rock, rocket ball ammunition and converted to much more powerful and reliable 44 caliber rimfire ammo. In 1860, he won the patent for his improvements and it was a war to follow that sealed the gun's reputation. Troops on both sides of the American Civil War prized that Henry, while it's predominantly Union soldiers who carried the Henry. Confederate President Jefferson Davis armed his bodyguards with captured Winchester repeating rifles. With its 16-round tubular magazine, it gained reputation for firepower. Confederates allegedly, allegedly declared it that damn Yankee rifle that you could load on Sunday and shoot all week. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. I'd like to call to the stage C.J. Bonner on deck is Zach Shapiro. I will be reciting an excerpt of one of Ben Franklin's speeches from the Constitutional Convention. In these sentiments, sir, I agree to this Constitution with all its faults. For when you assemble a number of men to have the advantage of their joint wisdom, you assemble with those men all their faults, their prejudices, their passions, their errors of opinion, and their selfish views. It therefore astonishes me, sir, to find this system approaching so near to perfection as it does. I think it will astonish our enemies. They are waiting with confidence to hear that our councils are confounded and that our states are on the point of separation. Thus, I consent, sir, to this Constitution. I could expect no better. Much of the strength and effectiveness of any government in gaining, in, in gaining and securing happiness of the people depends on the general opinion of the goodness of the government. And it also depends on the uh, wisdom and honor of its governors. I hope, therefore, that we shall act heartily and in a united way in recommending this cost Constitution. We may then turn our future thoughts and efforts to the means of having it well administered. On the whole, I will say this to every member of the Constitution who may have objections to this con Constitution. I would ask him to doubt a little of his own pride. I would ask him to add his name and make our support unanimous. Thank you. Thanks, CJ. I'd like to call to the stage Zach Shapiro. On deck is Paul Mahler. I'll be reciting Don't Quit by Walter Bond. My very first game, I broke my foot. I threw me a pity party. My trainer came to me and said, Walter, we could get you right back in five weeks for the Big Ten season. I said, Roger, when I come out of surgery, I want you to put me on the bike. I don't have time to rest. Can you do that for me? Can you take me to the stationary bike, put me on the bike, and tape my cast to the pedal? 
As soon as surgery was over, Roger carried me to the stationary bike, put me on the bike, and he taped my cast to the pedal. I had a customary workout. I had tears in my eyes as I pedaled. I said to myself, I can't quit. I can't give up. I came back in six weeks as we were playing against the Ohio State Buckeyes on national TV. I pulled up for my baseline jump shot that I had been trained to follow through every single day in practice. Even though I felt my foot break again, I still followed through. You have to be disciplined every single day and train yourself to follow through on all your fundamentals. And that's how you're going to be successful. You have to do it even when you don't feel like it. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. I'd like to call to the stage Paul Muller. On deck is Charles Ferris. Today I'll be reciting uh, Winston Churchill's On the Beaches. I have myself in full confidence that if all do their duties, if nothing is neglected and the best arrangements are made as they are being made, that we shall prove ourselves once again able to defend our island home, to ride out the storm of war, outlive the menace of tyranny, if necessary for years, if necessary alone. At any rate, that is what, going to, what we are going to try to do. That is a resolve of His Majesty's government, every man of them. That is the will of the Parliament and the nation, the British Empire and the French Republic, linked together and in their cause and in their need, shall defend to the death their native soil, aiding each other like good comrades to their utmost strength. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight in the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall defend. We shall fight. We shall fight in the beaches. We shall fight in the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. And even if, which I do not for a moment believe, that if this island or a large part of it were subjugated and starving, that our empire beyond the seas, armed and guarded by the British fleet, will continue the struggle until in God's good time, the new world with all its power and might shall step forth to the rescue and liberation of the old. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. I'd like to call to the stage Charles Ferris, please. I'll be reciting the Gettysburg Address. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men were created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final rest place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this, but in larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who have struggled here have consecrated it for all above our poor power to add or detract. The world will live no, no longer remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It's for us the living, rather to be here dedicated to the great task or to the unfinished work which they who have fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is altogether, it is for us the living, rather to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead should have that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish on earth. Thanks, Charles. I'd like at this time to call to the stage two rows, beginning with Parker Gorman and Wyatt Chisholm. Thanks.
Our next round of speakers will begin with Parker Gorman. On deck is Gavin, Gavin Albright, excuse me. On February 22nd, 1980, the American hockey team played the Soviet Union in the Winter Olympics. I will be reciting the pregame speech Herb Brooks made from the movie Miracle on Ice. Great moments are born from great opportunity, and that's what you have here tonight, boys. That's what you've earned here tonight, one game. If we play them 10 times, they might win nine. Not this game, not tonight. Tonight, we skate with them. Tonight, we stay with them, and we shut them down because we can. Tonight, we are the greatest hockey team in the world. You are born to be hockey players, every one of you, and you're meant to be here tonight. This is your time. Their time is done, it's over. I'm sick and tired of hearing of what a great hockey team the Soviets have. This is your time. Now go out there and take it. Thank you. Thanks, Parker. At this time, I'd like to call Gavin Albright to the stage. On deck is Jack Colton. I will be reciting an obituary printed on March 3rd, 1899 in the Vermont Phoenix newspaper. It is an obituary about the only Civil War member who lived in my hometown, Dummerston, Vermont, the late John Miller. John Miller, the veteran soldier and member of the Grand Army of the Republic, died on February 21st, 1899. His funeral was largely attended by his numerous relatives, citizens of the place, and members of the Colonel Williams H. Greenwood VFW Post of Putney. Mr. Miller now leaves a widow and three children. Mrs. Walter T. Walker, F. W. Miller, and Fayette Miller, all living in Dummerston. Five of his sisters are now living and one brother. He was born on April 6, 1836, son of John B. Miller, prosperous farmer of this town and grandson of John Miller, a revolutionary soldier, and great-grandson of Captain Isaac Miller, pioneer settler of the town. At the age of 27, he became a soldier in Companies K and C of the 9th Vermont Regiment and was a soldier, a sergeant of Company E.C. He was mustered out on December 1st, 1865. He was a brave soldier, a good patriot, and a genuine Republican. His illness was of long duration, extending over a period of more than a year. He is buried in Dummerson's Greenwood Cemetery. Thank you. Thanks, Gavin. I'd like to call to the stage Jack Colton. On deck is Angelo Sutton. In 1999, Holocaust survivor and Nobel laureate Elie Wiesel was invited by President Bill Clinton and First Lady Hillary Clinton to speak as part of the Millennium Lecture Series. I will be reciting an excerpt of his speech, The Perils of Indifference. In a way, to be indifferent to that suffering is what makes the human being inhuman. Indifference, after all, is more dangerous than anger and hatred. Anger can, at times, be creative. One writes a great poem, a great symphony. One does something special for the sake of humanity because one is angry at the injustice that one witnesses. But indifference is never creative. Even hatred at times may elicit a response. You fight it, you denounce it, you disarm it. Indifference elicits no response. Indifference is not a response. Indifference is not a beginning, it is an end. And therefore, indifference is always the friend of the enemy, for it benefits the aggressor, never his victim, whose pain is magnified when he or she feels forgotten the political prison in his cell, the hungry children, the homeless refugees. Not to respond to their plight, not to relieve their solitude by offering them a spark of hope, is to exile them from human memory. And in denying their humanity, we betray our own. Indifference, then, is not only a sin, it is a punishment. And this is one of the most important lessons of this outgoing century's wide-ranging experiments in good and evil. In the place that I come from, Society was composed of three simple categories, the killers, the victims, and the bystanders. During the darkest of times, inside the ghettos and death camps. And I'm glad that Mrs. Clinton mentioned that we are now commemorating that event, that period, 
that we are now in the days of remembrance. But then we felt abandoned, forgotten. All of us did. And our only miserable consolation was that we believed that Auschwitz and Treblinka were closely guarded secrets, that the leaders of the free world did not know what was going on behind those black gates and barbed wire, that they had no knowledge of the war against the Jews, the Hitler's armies, and their accomplices waged as part of the war against the Allies. If they knew, we thought, surely those leaders would have moved heaven and earth to intervene. They would have spoken out with great outrage and conviction. They would have bombed the railways leading to Birkenau. Just the railways, just once. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. I'd like to call to the stage Angelo Sutton. On deck is Matt Gobeal. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we're engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met here, we are met here on a great battlefield of that war. We have come here to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. For a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggle here have consecrated far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but they can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather to be here, dedicated to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is for us, the living, rather to be here, dedicated to the great task of men before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not die in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people should not perish from this earth. Thanks, Angelo. Could I please have Matt Cobiel come to the stage? On deck is Dan Chandy. Uh. The rainy day. The day is cold and dark and dreary. It rains and the wind is never weary. My thoughts still my, The vine still clings from the moldering ball. That at every gust the dead leaves fall. And the day is dark and dreary. My life is cold and dark and dreary. The, and it, it rains and the wind is never weary. My thoughts still cling to the moldering past. But the hope of youth falls thick in the blast. And the day is dark and dreary. Be still, sad heart, and cease the pining. Behind the cloud is the sun still shining. Thy fate is common fate of all. Into each life, some rain must fall. Some days must be dark and dreary. A nameless grave, a soldier of the Union, muster out, is the inscription on an unknown grave at Newport News, beside the salt sea wave, nameless and dateless, Sentinel or scout, shot down in some skirmish or disastrous rout of battle. When the loud artillery drave its iron wedges through the ranks of brave and doomed battalions, storming the redoubt, thou unknown hero, sleeping by the sea, in thy forgotten grave, with secret shame, I feel my pulses beat, my forehead burn, when what thou hast given for me. And I can, all thou that house, thy life, thy very name, and I can give thee nothing in return. Thanks, Matthew. I'd like to call Dan Chandy to the stage. On deck is Liam Grigg. I'm going to recite a quote from DJ Avicii who was a young and famous Swedish performer. During an interview, he was asked a question, do you have something to say to inspire young kids who are looking to find a place in the world? Here is what he said. My message to the youth, I would say, try to figure out what you're most passionate about in life and what you're good at, and you should give it your all, all the time. You have to work really hard if you want to get anywhere 
with whatever you do, if you work hard enough, you are going to succeed. And that's almost a fact. I've seen it many times. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Could I please have Lee and Greg come to the stage? On deck is Wyatt Chisholm. I shall be responding a speech by Edgar Gass. A boy and his dad on a fishing trip, there is a glorious fellowship. Father and son in the open skies, in the white clouds lazily drifting by. In the laughing stream as it runs along to the clicking reel like a martial song. And the father teaching the youngster gay how to land a fish in the sportsman way. I fancy I hear them talking there in an open boat in the speeches fair. And the boy is learning the ways of men from the finest man in his youthful ken. Kings to the youngster cannot compare with the gentle father who is with him there. And the greatest minds in the human race, not for one minute, can take his place. Which is happier, man or boy? The soul of the father is steeped in joy, for he is finding out to his heart's delight that his son is fit for the future fight. And he is learning the glorious death of him and the thoughts he thinks in his every whim. And he shall discover when night comes on how close he has grown to his little son. A boy and his dad on a fishing trip, builders of life companionship. Oh, I envy them as I see them there under the sky in the open air. For out of the old, old long ago, come the summer days I used to know. As I learned life's truths from my father's lips, as I shared the joy of his fishing trips. Thank you. Thanks, Liam. Wyatt Chismore, if you could come to the stage. On deck is Court Jones. Hi, I'm Wyatt. I chose an inspirational speech called You owe it to yourself. You owe it to yourself to be great. You owe it to yourself. Let me tell you something. You owe it to your family to set an example of someone who lives the life they want to live. A strong example of a strong human being. You owe it to everyone you love to set an example of what a great life looks like so they can follow in your footsteps. You can't help anyone until you help yourself. And when you make you strong, that strength will spill over to everyone else. They will be inspired by you. They will follow in your footsteps for many generations to come. You owe it to yourself to be the kind of person you want to be. When it is hard, you push yourself harder. You owe it to yourself to feel that pride. You owe it to yourself to be great. Okay. Thanks, Wyatt. If I could call Court Jones to the stage, um, on deck is Lex Goodman. I am Court Jones, and I will be reciting the Order of the Day speech, also known as the D-Day speech, by Dwight D. Eisenhower, the Supreme Commander of the European Forces. Uh, soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon a great crusade for which you have striven these past many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine and the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe. Your task and, and security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. But this is the year 1944. Much has happened since the Nazi triumphs of 1940 and 1941. The United Nations has inflicted upon the Germans great defeats. Our air offensive is seriously reduced, their capacity to wage war on the ground, and our home fronts have given us an overwhelming support in weapons and munitions of war, and placed at our disposal great reserves of trained fighting men. The free men of the world march together to victory. No, the tide has turned. The free men of the world march together to victory. I have full confidence in your devotion 
courage, and dedication to duty. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us all beseech the almighty blessing of God upon this great and noble undertaking. Thank you. Thanks, Court. Can I please have Lex Goodman come to the stage? On deck, Ben Schooler. <laughs> There's no greater pat on the back or tip of the cap, cap than this from the industry, from the people who vote, whether they're drivers, journalists, industry execs, or what. It's such a great feeling that somebody felt I made an impact on the sport. There's a point in my career I started to think, I'm not going to win seven championships, maybe not even one championships, perhaps not even four a hundred, a hundred races, perhaps not even 40 races. People wanted me to be like my father when I realized I wasn't going to win those races and championships. I started to think what I could do outside of that to help what else I could control to help the sport and be a good ambassador for the sport. There's a, I wasn't always p perfect, but started focusing in those years by being accessible, by being a, accountable. I feel I did a decent job that I don't, I don't want to sit here and measure that. I'm pretty happy about the part of my current impact. Oh my. The impact I had on the sport. Oh my God. Thanks, Lex. I'd like to call Ben Schooler to the stage. On deck is Morgan Queen. I will be reciting Jim Galvano's ESPY's award-winning speech. I can't tell you what an honor it is to be mentioned in the same breath as Arthur Ashe. This is something I certainly will treasure forever. Time is very precious to me, and I don't know how much time I have left, and there are some things that I would like to say. Now I'm fighting cancer. To me, there are three things we all should do every day. Number one is we should laugh every day. Number two is that we should think. We should spend some time in thought. Number three is that you should have your emotions move to tears. It could be happiness, it could be joy. But think about it. If you laugh, you think, and you cry every day, that's a full day. That's a heck of a day. <laughs> if you do that seven days a week, that's something special. ESPN has been so kind to support me and allowed me to announce tonight that we are starting the V Foundation for Cancer Research. And its motto is don't give up, don't ever give up. That's what I'm gonna to try to do every minute that I have left. I know I gotta go, and I've said it before, and I wanna say it again. Cancer can take away all my physical abilities, but it cannot touch my mind, it cannot touch my heart, and it cannot touch my soul. And those three things are gonna carry on forever. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Morgan Queen, could you please come to the stage? On deck is Clyde Gwartzman. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to proposition all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come here to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this, but in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. 
For the brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, nor long remember, what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be here dedicated to the unfinished work which those who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, and this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Thanks, Morgan. Could I have Clyde Gordsman come to the stage, please? On deck is Rafa Andrew Moore. This is, this is an excerpt from the seminar called The Craft of Law Teaching by my uncle Donnie Gordsman. So, when I was a law student, there were two types of classes for me. There are classes where I connected with the professor. There are classes where I didn't. The classes where I didn't connect with the professor, I was a brat. How big of a brat? Well, for my civil procedures class, I mostly did like the New York Times crossword puzzle directly in front of the professor just to show how disconnected we were. But then, er, then for my fed courts, I routinely walked out around, you know, 45 minutes in because I felt disconnected. Then for my first year con law, I wrote like a treatise length faculty evaluation of a professor that is now the dean of a prominent law school, explaining just how disconnected we were. I was a nightmare, but then I think about the classes where I connected with the professor. I was a different sort of person there because it reminded me of great theater. And then I think about this moment, right? The first time I saw the angel crash through the ceiling into Prior Walter's bedroom, I felt deeply connected in that moment. It moved me and changed me due to seeing it. So now let's think for a second. What did my property course have in common with this scene? What do great theater and great teaching have in common? How could my property professor make me feel the same way I did when I saw that angel crash through the ceiling? Now I want to suggest that great theater and great teaching have two things in common, immediacy and aliveness. Now, I think by incorporating immediacy and aliveness into our teaching, we can be great. We can be the best law professors. Well, it's true. Live theater has immediacy because it takes place in real time. But what we do, us monks, happens in real time. And so there's an immediacy to that. Movies are about what's happened in the past. Live theater is about what's happening now. But that's not enough. There has to be something at stake for there to be real immediacy. There is a box right next to me in the center of the stage. And at some point, someone in this room is going to open it. And lives are going to be changed when it happens. Thank you. Thanks, Clyde. Rafa Andrew Moore, could you please come to the stage? I'll be reciting an excerpt from an um, essay about mountain biking. As a mountain biker, I spend hours thinking, practicing, questioning, waiting to get lost in one moment. No time to think, just reaction, focus. All the worry washed away by the rush. Mountain biking has taught me that. Mountain biking can be hard. It can also be. Mountain biking can be. Mountain biking has taught me that life can be filled with hard things, steep hills and thrilling views, moments of agony and moments of excitement. Mountain biking has taught me that is that no matter what, finishing well is more important than finishing first. Although I mention mountain biking, that's not what this writing is about. It's about the aspects of life and the lessons and knowledge we gain from the way we go through life. 
Just like me learning from mountain biking that life can be hard, it can also be rewarding. It's scary to think that we will go through life and never see parts of the world, and on top of that, parts of places we live. Life is too short to reminisce about the things we can't or won't do. It's about the things we can do today that matter. Thanks, Rafa. Could I please have the next two rows come up, starting with Matt Campo and Kevin Gainsland. This time I'd like to call Matthew Campo to the stage. On deck is James Jackson. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. While our sins, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. We have the brave man living and dead who have consecrated far above our poor power to our each act. The world will little no, no longer remember what we say here. We can never forget what they did here. It is us, the living, rather to be dedicated to the great task remaining before us. That from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause, that for which we gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not die in vain, um, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall have a new birth. Just perish from the earth. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Can I please have James Jackson come to the stage? On deck is Max Burris. I'll be saying a speech from uh, by Erwin Smith from Attack on Titan. <laughs> Everything that you thought had meaning, every hope, dream, or moment of happiness, none of it matters as you lie bleeding out on the battlefield. None of it changes what a speeding rock does to a body. We all die. But does that mean our lives were meaningless? Does that mean that there was no point in our being born? Would you say that of our slain comrades? What about their lives? Were they meaningless? They were not. Their lives serve as an example to us all. The courageous fallen, the anguished fallen. Their lives have meaning because we, the living, refuse to forget them. And as we ride into certain death, we ex, oh, Q. We trust our successors to do the same for us, because my soldiers do not buckle or yield when faced with the cruelty of this world. My soldiers push forward. My soldiers scream out. My soldiers rage. Thank you. Thanks, James. I'd like to call Max Burst to the stage. On deck is Ben Starkman. Um, I will be reciting a speech from Vincent van Gogh. I dream my paintings and paint my dreams to see the stars clearly, infinity on high, 
and then life seems almost enchanted after all. Then there's nature, art, and poetry. And if that is not enough, what is enough? There's nothing more truly artistic than the love of people. A great fire burns within me, but no one stops to warm themselves by it. Yeah. Passersby only see wisps of smoke. I don't know anything with certain, but seeing the stars make me dream. Thanks, Max. Ken Starkman, if you could come to the stage, please. On deck is Charlie Jellema Harcher. I'll be a sad and Lou Gehrig's for us, bitch. Fans, for the past two weeks, you have been reading about the bad book I got. Yet today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of his earth. I have been in bar parks for 17 years and have never received anything of kindness and encouragement from the fans. Look at these grand, grand men, which of you wouldn't consider it the highlight of his career, just associate with them for even one day. Sure, I'm lucky. Who wouldn't consider it an honor to have known Jacob Bepper, also the of baseball's greatest empire, Ed Bell, to have spent six years with a wonderful little fellow, Miller Huggins, then to have spent like nine years with the steel needle, that spot student of psychology, the best man in John baseball today, John McCarthy. Sure, I'm lucky. When the New York Giants, a team will give the right arm to beat, and vice versa, sends a gift. That's something. When everybody down to the groundskeepers and those boys in red coats and mumbled of trophies, that's something. When the wonderful mother-in-law you take sides to and squabbles with her own daughter, that's something. When the father and mother hook all lives so you can have an education and build a body, it's a blessing. When the wife who has been a tower of strength and shown more courage and dream assisted, that's the final center. So close and saying that I may have had a tough pick, but I have an awful lot to live for. Thanks, man. Could I please have Charlie Jellema Harter come to the stage? On deck is Gordon Lau. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met here on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place, those who here gave their lives, that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, no longer remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they have fought here thus far, so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last measure of devotion that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, and this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Well done, Charlie. Gordon Lau, if you could come to the stage, please. On deck is Chris Lehman. I will be reciting Elegy for Hallowness from Hollow Knight. 
in the wilds beyond. They speak her name with reverence and regret. For none could tame our savage souls, yet you the challenge met. Under palest watch, you taught, we changed. Base instincts were redeemed. A world you gave to bug and beast, as they had never dreamed. Our cherished dreams, you granted and delivered more. But in dismay, you found too late, our desires had no end. What cost to tame our savagery? You gave your all, and then gave more. Yet still desires lay unquenched, more dreams remain, your energies. Amongst it sprang a dreadful scourge, that forced return our aggressive urge, and turned us back to beasts or husks, our souls consumed by light above. Within your corpse can still be heard the plaintive cries of one who took our pain and loss and dreams inside the self too. Through its pain, we found a truth that must now be confessed, for nothing can contain such things but perfect emptiness. Thank you. Well done, Gordon. Chris Lehman, if you could come to the stage, please. On deck is Kevin Gainsland. On February 22, 1980, the American hockey team played the Soviet Union in the Winter Olympic Finals. The Soviet Union was a four-time defending gold medalist and expected to win. In the last seconds, the U.S. won 4-3, an amazing accomplishment. I'll be reciting the pregame speech Herb Brooks made in the movie Miracle on Ice. Great moments are born from great opportunities, and that's what you have here tonight. That's what you've earned here tonight. One game. If we played them ten times, they might win nine. But not this one. Not tonight. Tonight we skate with them. Tonight we stay with them and we shut them down because we can. Tonight we are the greatest hockey team in the world. You were born to be hockey players, every one of you. And you were meant to be here tonight. This is your time. Their time is done. It's over. I'm sick and tired of hearing about what a great hockey team the Soviets have. This is your time. Now go out there and take it. Thank you. Well done, Chris. Kevin Gainsland, if I could have you come to the stage. On deck is Link Sweeney. I will be reciting a speech by Joshua Chamberlain from the 1993 Gettysburg movie. Whether you fight or not, that's up to you. Whether you come along is, well, you're coming. You know who we are and what we're doing here, but if you're gonna fight alongside us, there are a few things I want you to know. This regiment was formed last summer in Maine. There were thousands of us then. There are less than 300 of us now. We all volunteered to fight for the Union just as you have. Some came mainly because you we were bored at home, thought this looked like it might be fun. Some came because they were ashamed not to. Many of us came because it was the right thing to do, and all of us have seen men die. This, er, thank you. Oh, this is a different kind of army. Uh, America should be free ground, all of it, not divided by a line between slave state and free, all of it, from here to the Pacific Ocean. No man has to bow, no man born of royalty. Here we judge on what you do, not who your father was. Here you can be something. Here is a place to build a home. It's not the land, there's always more land. What are we fighting for? In the end, we're fighting for each other. Thank you. Well done, Kevin. Link Sweeney, if I could have you come to the stage. On deck is Peter Orbo. I will be reciting a speech by Alan Watts called What is Reality? A person who thinks all the time has nothing to think about except thoughts. So he loses touch with reality. 
and lives in a world of illusion. By thoughts, I mean specifically chatter in the skull, perpetual and compulsive repetition of words, of reckoning and calculate. I'm not saying that thinking is bad. Like everything else, it's useful in moderation. A good servant, but a bad master. And all so-called civilized peoples have increasingly become crazy and self-destructive because through excessive thinking, they have lost touch with reality. That's to say, we confuse signs with the real world. Most of us would have rather money than tangible wealth, and a great occasion is somehow spoiled for us unless photographed. And to read about it the next day in the newspaper is oddly more fun for us than the original event. This is a disaster. For as a result of confusing the real world of nature with mere signs, we are destroying nature. We're so tied up in our minds that we've lost our sense of us. Time to wake up. What is reality? Obviously, no one can say because it isn't words. It isn't material, that's just an idea. Reality is this. Thank you. Hold on, Link. Pete Borbeau, if you could come to the stage. On deck, Alexander Katani. I will be reciting a speech by the great Muhammad Ali. I still am the greatest. I have always believed in myself, even as a young child, growing up in Louisville, Kentucky. My parents instilled a sense of pride and confidence in me and taught me and my brother that we could be the best at anything. I must have believed them because I remember being the neighborhood marble champion and challenging my neighborhood buddies to see who could jump the tallest hedges or run a foot race the length of a block. Of course, I knew when I made this challenge that I was gonna win. I never even thought of losing. In high school, I boasted weekly, if not daily, that one day I was gonna become the heavyweight champion of the world. And as part of my boxing training, I would run down 4th Street in downtown Louisville, darting in and, out of, in and out of local shops, taking just enough time to tell them that I was training for the Olympics and I was gonna win a gold medal. And when I came back home, I was gonna turn pro and become the world heavyweight champion in boxing. I never thought of the possibility of failing, only of the fame and glory I was gonna get when I won. I could see it, I could feel it. When I proclaimed that I was the greatest of all time, I believed in myself and I still do. Thanks, Pete. Alexander Katani, if you could come to the stage. On deck is Jimmy Gould. I'm Alexander Katani. Here is an excerpt from the speech Reason for Hope by primatologist Jane Goodall. Today we know the world is in a mess, socially and environmentally and economically. And there's a lot of reason for depression. And people are always asking me, Jane, do you really have hope for the future? You've seen so much suffering. You've seen forests disappear. You've seen chimpanzees tortured in medical research laboratories. You've seen crippling poverty. You've seen people harmed by conflict. Do you really have hope for the future? And I do have my reasons for hope, but I think the most important and meaningful reason for hope for me is the young people. And so wherever I go around the world, and I am traveling 300 days a year, I always try and get to schools. I always try and encourage young people to come together, the different Roots and Shoots groups bringing their different projects, getting together, sharing their projects. And because each child is encouraged to think of a project that they care about, they're all passionate. They're passionate about their projects. So the reason I have hope because of Roots and Shoots is it isn't that young people can change the world, they are. Thank you. Well done, Alexander. 
Jimmy Gould, if you could come to the stage, please. On deck, Mauro Ramos. All right, well, yeah, it works for me. All right, I'll be reading a version of Discovery of Life by Susan von Helio, a Peruvian poet who came to the support of the Republic in the Spanish Civil War. All right. Gentlemen, today is the first time that I realize the presence of life. Gentlemen, I beg you to leave me alone for a moment so I may savor this formidable, spontaneous, and recent life emotion, which today, for the first time, enraptures me, makes me happy to the point of tears. My joy comes from what is unexperienced of my emotion, my exultation comes from the fact that before, I did not feel the presence of life. I have never felt it. In, and if, if anyone would say that I have felt it, he is lying. He is lying, and his lie hurts me to such a degree that would make me miserable. My joy comes from my faith in this dis personal discovery of life. And no one can go against this faith. If anyone would try, his tongue would fall out. His bones would fall out, and he would risk picking up others, not his own, to keep himself standing before my eyes. Never except now has life existed. Never except now have people walked by. Never except now have there been houses and avenues, air and horizons. If my friend Pierre came over right now, I'd tell him I did not know him, and that we must begin anew. When, in fact, have I met my friend Pierrette? Today would be the first time we became acquainted, and I'd tell him to go away and come back and drop in on me, as if he did not know me. That is, for the first time. What a short time I have lived. My birth is so recent. There is no unit of measure to count my age. I have just been born. I have not even lived yet. Gentlemen, I am so tiny, the day hardly fits inside me. Never except now did I hear the racket of cart carry stone for a great construction on Boulevard and Hansman. Never except now did I advance parallel to the spring, saying to it, if death had been something else. Never except now did I see the golden light of the sun on the cupolas of Sacre Cœur. Never except now did I know a door existed and another door and the cordial song of the distances, let me alone, knife has now struck me in all my death. Thank you very much. Well done, Jimmy. I'd like to welcome our final speaker of the evening to the stage, Mauro Ramos. Hello, everyone. Today I'm going to be reciting the I Have a Dream speech by Martin Luther King. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day, down in Alabama, with its vicious races, with its governor, having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. And when this happens, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Well done, Mark. Thank you.
I think these guys need another round of applause. While the judges are deliberating and identifying award recipients, I'd like to introduce members of the Greenwood Rock Band. Jack Preston, Blaze Crosby, Clyde, Clyde Gerwitzman, sorry Clyde, Jack Shaw. Our musical director is the talented and incredibly witty, where is he, Aaron Chesley.
next song we're going to play is Watermelon Man by Herbie Hancock. The original mouthpiece. No,
This is our last song, Come Together, by the Beatles.
Thanks, Brad. I don't know if the rock band is right here, but I think for Jack and Jack and Blaze and Clyde and Aaron, they were outstanding. And it's... performance that you just saw of the rock band is just a teaser because we have a little surprise for you at the end. So hang tight. A little bit like the Emmys, uh, the, the ballot or the, the awards have been delivered. So if we can have our seat. We have three categories of awards that we present uh, at the Gettysburg event. The first category is Getty, the Gettysburg uh, to be awarded first, second, and third prize uh, for reciting the Gettysburg Address. The second category is an alternative speech, or an alternate speech. It is to our 11th and 12th graders, first, second, and third, and an alternate speech of the middle school, ninth grade, and 10th grade. So, without further pause, ado, let's award. For the Gettysburg, in third place, Morgan Queen. In second place, Charlie. Jelima Harder. In first place, Azor Hartenstein. alternative speech for our middle school ninth and tenth graders. In third place, Wyatt Chismore. In second place, Ben Starkman.
In first place, Gordon Lau. And our alternative speech for 11th and 12th graders in third place, Peter Barbeau. In second place, Maro Ramos. And in first place, Alexander Katani. Congratulations to all of our students, an incredibly amazing show of talent and grit and presentation. Before we close our 2022 Gettysburg Ceremony, though, it is essential to thank the many individuals that have been instrumental in making this event a success. In the back left corner, this way, are three judges who have given up their time to join us this afternoon and help, help us uh, award the presentations. And I want to tell you a little bit about those three individuals. Marilyn Bookwalder is a dear friend of Greenwood and spent many years as a language and literacy teacher. She has an intimate connection to the Gettysburg Address, having coached and supported students during her years at Greenwood. Presently, Marilyn focuses on her private practice as a tutor, advocate, and consultant for families and individuals. Connie Evans, like Marilyn, knows Greenwood intimately through her roles as a language and literacy tutor and history teacher. Connie was drawn to Greenwood understanding that this small school that supported students who learned differently could change the lives for the better. Both Marilyn and Connie maintain relationships with past and current Greenwood teachers and alumni. Susan Owings is a longstanding educator who understands the importance of providing a teaching platform where all students have the opportunity to succeed. Over the last two years, Sue has joined our seniors as a community representative during their senior roundtable presentations. Thank you, judges, for being here today. I think it's an almost impossible task to try to choose or identify the students who are the award recipients, because all of these students presenting today, presenting in a smaller venue at school, or choosing to, prevent, to present in the future our award recipients. So to all the Greenwood students for all their hard work over the last couple of months, we applaud you 
and celebrate you and congratulate you. Also at this point, I would ask you to turn to the back of the theater and acknowledge Michael Hanisch, videographer, Bill Esses, sound engineer, and Peter Wilson, lights. I would also add that the video that you watched at Duo and the video that will accompany this video of the Gettysburg performance uh, were done by a friend and uh, a good friend of, of Greenwood, Benjamin Stimson, and those videos will be forthcoming to you in the next few days. Thank you to John Potter, executive director of the Latches Theater, who supported Greenwood in 2021 when we utilized the theater to produce the live stream performance that was sent to you last year. Today, John has welcomed Greenwood back to the Lashes Theater, and we are very, very grateful. Some of you may know the, the name Devin Witham. Devin is our all hands-on deck IT guy at school, and he is also the person that helped us set up and show the video at Duo today. And I think Devin is here, and I'd just like to say thank you, Devin, for all your hard work. There are a, a few individuals that must uh, also be recognized, and I also want to shower them. That's not quite the right word, but I want to give them a set of flowers and thank them for their hard work. Uh, first, thank you to Ted Mastin, our on-deck announcer, for introducing each presenter to the stage. Thank you, Ted. Thank you to Aaron Chesley, a musical genius who has inspired our Greenwood rock band. I told Aaron I was going to hug him, and he said, I'm all in. I think that's a good sign. A special thank you to Hallie Cohen, our Q master and co-Gettysburg support person, to Ann Bebko, our internal director and all things Gettysburg mentor, and to Jocelyn Bullard, our external director and overseer of the global Gettysburg roadmap. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The execution of an event such as Gettysburg cannot happen without the deep understanding and appreciation for all the parts and an eye on the outcome. Again, with heartfelt gratitude and appreciation to all the folks that made this event happen, uh, we are really, really thankful. Each weekday morning at school, we begin our day with a morning circle, a time for announcements, followed by a moment of silence. It seems fitting to incorporate a brief moment of silence before closing our program today and recognize that the world is navigating challenging moments. Join me in taking a moment to reflect on peace and hope and wellness throughout the world. And finally, Congratulations to our parents, our families, our faculty, staff, and students. A terrific event that highlights the strength of your sons, the tireless devotion of the Greenwood faculty and staff, and the deep and abiding love you share with your child as a parent. Before you head out, here's the teaser. I'm going to invite the rock band back because we have a little surprise rendition of a famous song called Stand By Me. So Aaron, bring them back. I'd like anyone who would like to, you are welcome to A, sing along, and you are welcome if you'd like to come up to the stage and sing along. We invite you up. 
This is the closing of our event, which is outstanding, and so let's have fun. Jocelyn reminds me that the lyrics are inside your program. Okay, here comes Annie. <laughs> Yeah, keep it coming. <laughs> Are we going to sing in the mic or no? We're in here. Okay. He's got a mic. Hey, man. Hey. Hey.
two-week break. Congratulations to everyone. Thank you for being here.